good morning and to welcome to the last lesson on the English of speech. This is the fifth and the last lesson. Without much ado, let's continue. Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. It is the attribution of human traits or qualities to objects or animals, okay, or other deities. You may have a doubt, so then what is the difference between anthropomorphism and uh, personification? I'll explain that as I continue this lesson. The difference between anthropomorphism and personification is that in anthropomorphism an animal or deity actually behaves or talks or wears clothing that human beings do. That is the difference. Now let's go ahead. Whereas in personification there is only a projection of human traits or human qualities into the animals or objects, but they do not actually behave like human beings. This is the difference. When you look at the examples, uh, it will be clear to you. Examples of Anthropomorphism. All of you know this. Winnie the Pooh and his friends. There, the characters speak or dress like human beings. Mickey Mouse, talking and wearing human, uh, uh, in human way. Aesop's Fables. Again, the characters there begin speak or dress like humans. The best example from literature is George Orwell's famous allegorical novel, Animal Farm. When we discuss animal farm during our survey of English literature, I will talk more about it. The next on our list is pathetic fantasy. Now you are going to have a problem. We will solve the problem as we go ahead. Anthropomorphism, pathetic fantasy, and personification. They can sometimes confuse you. But I will see that you don't get confused. Okay. This term was coined by John Ruskin. From the examination point of view, this is very important. Who coined the term pathetic fantasy? John Rustic. It is the attribution again of human emotions to inanimate objects of nature. Human emotions of say uh, anger or, or uh, sadness or, or happiness. Only such emotions are transferred to inanimate objects of nature. That is pathetic fantasy. Let's look at some. See, it's, it is a kind of personification. Don't get confused pathetic fantasy with personification. Let's look at examples. Now, the difference between pathetic fantasy and personification is that in the former only human emotions are given to inanimate objects. In the former means in pathetic fallacy. Whereas in the latter, that is personification, all human attributes are given to inanimate objects. In pathetic fallacy, only human emotions. But in personification, all attributes of humans are given to inanimate objects. This is the difference. Okay. Examples of pathetic fallacy. They are written at the top. Don't get confused. These are examples of pathetic fallacy. 
The somber crowd darkened our mood. Here, somber. That is seriousness. This the quality, this emotion is transferred to the clouds. So it becomes a pathetic analysis. The weeping cloud, sadness is transferred to the clouds. The night has been unruly violence. The unruly behavior of the humans is transferred to the night. Maybe it's a stormy night. That's why unruly night. The wild and the windy night, wild. Humans become wild. Okay, terrible. I wandered lonely as a cloud from William Wordsworth. Uh, loneliness is transferred to cloud. Now, next one is pun is a very important uh, uh, figure of speech. Another name for pun is paranamasia. Paranamasia is another word for pun. What is pun? I have described it here. In simple words, it is a play on words which have dual meaning. That is fun. Okay. Let's look at the difference between fun and malapropism. We have already seen malapropism. Now, fun, as I have given here. The difference between pun and malapropism is that pun is a play on dual meaning of a word. A word has dual meaning. Whereas malapropism is the blundering use of an inappropriate word. It's a mistake. It is a mistake committed by the speaker. But pun is not a mistake. Deliberately, the word is used. To, to, to bring to the attention of the readers certain meaning. Okay. Or to make the readers think deeply. Okay. Examples. First, let us look at some examples of fun. Time flies like an arrow. Here, like is a preposition. Fruit flies like a banana. This is a fun. Because the writer is playing on the word like, which here has a dual meaning. Okay, next. The life of a, this is example of malapropism. This is example of malapropism. I am just drawing a comparison between the two. I am showing the difference. The life of a patient of hypertension is always at the stake. Instead of saying at stake, the speaker here is using stake. This is a vivid example of malapropism. Okay. Now, more examples of fun. I have now given you the difference between fun and malapropism. Now, let's look at more examples of fun. Ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave man. Grave man. What meaning? Serious man. When you come and meet me tomorrow, I will be a very serious man. Another meaning? I will be dead. This is fun. Her cat is near the computer to keep an eye on the mouse. You know, mouse has two meanings here. I was struggling to figure out how lightning works, but then it struck me. Oh, conducting a research into how lightning happens. Then suddenly it struck me. What? He understood. He understood it. the process of lightning. See? Dual meaning for the word struck here. I have been to the dentist many times, so I know the drill. Drill is that kind of that instrument when you use to, to, to drill your tooth when you go to a dentist, maybe you yeah, have filling and etc. Now, drill also has another meaning, not doing exercise. So you go to the dentist often, 
So that is a kind of exercise. So dual meaning for the word will. This is fun. Fun is used deliberately by the writers. Next one. A boy and every morning is hard to beat. No beat. The boy that to be great. That's what meaning. Next one is hard to beat means difficult to resist the temptation of taking a boiled egg every morning. So, dual meaning. Next one, simile. Now, simile is an explicit or uh, I mean, an explicit metaphor. Okay, it is like metaphor comparing to things, but in simile we use words like as or like. So, in the examination if you find Two things compared using as or like, then it is simile, and the metaphor is uh, implied simile. There will not be the words as or like. Okay. I already explained. Let's not waste time. Examples. He fights like a lion. Like a lion. Same thing can be expressed using metaphor. How? Oh. He is a lion in the fight. We have no as or like used. He is as cunning as a fox. Or he is a fox is a metaphor. He is as cunning as a fox is a simile. Epic simile. Milton has used it. What is epic simile? It is a detailed, often very complex pointing comparison that reveals or unfolds over the course of several lines, not in one line. Example, it is also known as Homeric simile because the king fight, Homer used it in his famous uh, epics, Iliad and Odyssey. Okay. For the example now, book one of Paradise Lost, in this book, John Milton compares Lucifer's massive army. Lucifer organized an army against God, God's army. Okay, led by Angel Gabriel. Okay. So John Milton compares Lucifer's massive army to scattered autumn leaves, not in one line, over several lines. Next one, Sinat Deki. Next one on our list is Sinat Deki. What is this? This is a very important one. Very often questions are asked on this figure of speech. It is a figure of speech in which a part of something is used to represent the whole. Or the whole is used to represent the part. Examples will help you understand this better. It may also use larger groups to refer to smaller groups or vice versa. Furthermore, it may also call a thing by the name of the material it is made of. Calling a thing by the name of the material it is made of. Or it may refer to a thing a container or packaging by the name of that container or packaging. Are you confused? Don't worry. You don't have to learn by heart the definitions. Let one example eat or every figure of speech remain in your mind. Then things will be easier. These are the examples. I want a hundred head of cattle. A hundred head. Now, head is part of an animal. Now, here the part head is used to refer to the whole animal. So, I bought, I bought a hundred head of cattle. You know the heads. Hundred head of cattle. That means hundred cows or so. Who is that great beard? Who is that great beard? Billion is part of a man, man's body. So this 
part is used to refer to the whole to the whole man. Here the part period is used to refer to the whole man, the old man. We have a hundred hired hands. We have a hundred hired hands. Hands are parts of humans. Hired for hundred hands means hundred laborers. There were many anxious faces. Means face is part of a person, human being. Hundred anxious faces, or there were several anxious faces. Means anxious people. Taking so much of coke is unhealthy. Now, this coke is commonly uh, used for all carbonated drinks. So it is a synthetic technique for all carbonated drinks. Now, difference between synecdoche and metonymy. Metonymy. You have a problem, right? Let us look at the difference. While they resemble, while they resemble one another to some extent, they are not the same. Sometimes uh, in the exam hall, this can create confusion. But I will make it clear now. Synecdoche refers to the whole of the thing by the name of any one of its parts. That means the part here expressed is an integral part of the thing or the person. The part is not an external thing. Wait, I'll make it clearer. For example, Calling a car wheels is a synecdoche. Why? Because a part of the car, its wheels stands for the whole car. Wheels here is part, integral part of the car. Oh, oh wait, I'll give another example later. However, in metonymy, in metonymy, the word used to describe a thing is only closely related to that particular thing, but not an integral part of it. Okay, the object that we use to refer to something is not, or somebody is not, an integral part, not an inseparable part. It is external to the person or thing that we represent to. Okay. Or we relate to, we refer to. For example, we use crown to refer to a king or a queen. And crown is not an integral part of the king or the queen. Like hands or head. You understand? It is external to the person. So if you are given a statement or a sentence or a line, and one, and there are two of among the four options, suppose there are there are uh, there are these two figures of speech here, synecdoche and metonymy. You must remember this explanation. Okay, metonymy. Uh, in metonymy, the the object is not an integral part of the thing it refers to. But in synecdoche, the part is an integral part of the whole. This is the difference. Next one, tautology. This is very, very easy. Quite often they ask questions on this. It is stating the same thing in different words. We call it mm, redundancy as well in English grammar. Repeat that again. Very often we all say that. Can you repeat that again? This is tautology. You have to say. Can you repeat it? Not can you repeat it again? Forward planning. Planning itself is forward. <laughs> shout it loud. <laughs> shout it. Why did you say shout it loud? Okay. It's a free gift. It's a gift. Gift is always free. I personally made this card for you with my own hands. I personally made it for you. Why with my own hands? 
Why do you make it with your legs or what? <laughs> okay, okay. Zubma. Zubma. What is Zubma? Interesting. In Zubma, one verb, not preposition, mostly verb, joins two objects in a sentence. That means one verb has two objects. The subject, verb, object. So one verb has two objects. Often with different meanings. That is the point here. Let's look at example. I left. This is the verb in the sentence. My heart and my suitcase in San Francisco. Left has two objects. My heart and my suitcase. But the meaning is different. Left my heart means no, I love that place. I think of that place. It is in my memory. I have become so 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 fascinated with the place. Left my suitcase means an object. You forgot it then. See the <coughs> difference? It's so much. He fished for trout and for compliments. Trout is a kind of fish. He fished for trout and for compliments. That means he, he was looking for compliments from other people. See, the meaning changes. On our first date, when a boy and girl go out hmm, uh, together for, for, for a movie or for, for uh, some kind of entertainment or for a dinner or lunch, whatever. On our first date, I held my breath. Means I was very tense. First date, you know, very tense. What to say, what not to say. Or what to wear, what not to wear. I held my breath. That is the first object of the verb, held. And the car door for her. <laughs> Two different meanings. Uh, when they got out of the car, he opened the door of the car and the car. See the difference in meaning. Held is the verb. Two objects, but with the totally different meanings. The storm sank my boat and my dreams. We understand. Sag what? Boat. Okay. Go on the house. Then my dreams. It's a kind of, you know, uh, figure of speech or it's a kind of idiom. Sag my dreams. Sag my dreams. All my dreams were ruined, destroyed because the boat, okay, the, the stop sank. The boat and with that, maybe he lost a lot of things or he died, whatever. All his dreams were shattered. Next, the disgruntled walker quickly took his belongings, you understand, his baggage, and his leave. He took leave from his company. See, two different objects uh, for the same verb took. The farmers in the valley grew potatoes, peanuts, and gold. Who wants that? Okay. First we understand, the farmers grew potatoes, peanuts, and then they became bold. They grew, bold means became bold. You see, the verb is grew by different objects with the different meanings. He lost his briefcase, then his job, then his mind. And he went out of his mind. That means he lost control of his mind. Different meanings. Different objects, but the verb is same, lost. This is Sukma. Examples of Sukma from literature, just one, one or two. Golden lands and girls are must as chimney sweepers come to dust. This is from the place for a chimney sweeper. Okay, here coming to dust has two meanings. First, the profession, the trade of the chimney speaker. The trade of the chimney speaker comes to an end. The next one is die. So two meanings. Okay. All must come to dust. Last one on our list. Spoonerism. One question was asked uh, this year by the University of Hyderabad. I have sent the question paper to I think all of you. If not, I will send. You can find one question on this. 
So you may not get so many questions on figures of speech. You may get one or two. But one mark or two marks will make a difference with regard to your rank. Okay? Now, it's very interesting. It is a verbal error in which a speaker accidentally transposes or exchanges the initial sounds or letters of two or more words and often creating a comic effect. Sometimes writers use it deliberately to create a comic effect, but sometimes people make mistakes. Okay, let's look at some examples. Interesting. Before that, it is named after Reverend William Archibald Spooner. He was a pastor, a Christian pastor, and he was in the habit of making such errors. That's why this gets the name Spoonerism after his name. Okay, examples very fast. There are many. You have his the mystery lectures. You have missed the history lectures. Okay, what happened? H and M transposed. So you get, you have, it was saying, missed the history lectures. M and H transposed. The result is what? You have missed the history lectures. Instead of, you have missed the history lectures. Next. The Lord is a showing shepherd. The Lord is a loving shepherd. That is transposed. It is Customary to kiss the bride. It is customary to kiss the bride. In the examples of spoken examples. I have in my bosom a half warmed fish. In Shrasi, I have in my bosom a half formed fish. I think uh, uh, Spurer uh, said this to Queen Victoria. That's what history says. Now, our Queer old dean or queer old dean, what does it mean? Our dear old queen, Sponanism, will nobody pat my hiccup? Hiccup? <laughs> will nobody pick up my hat? You noble sons of soil, you noble sons of soil, you sort of sons, okay, tons. Please sow me to another sheep. What is meaning of sow? Mr. Stitch, please show me to another seat. You have tasted two verbs. You have wasted two terms. Is the bean dissing? Is the dean dissing? Scholarism. A blushing crow. This was the, was, was the same example as here in this year's exam by the University of Hyderabad. Okay, I am happy. The same example given to my previous students was asked. A blushing crow. A crushing crow. C and B transposed. Spoonerism. Take a towel. Take a shower. Lack of eyes. Lack of light. Now your brows. Blow your nose. Frog of bags. Block of flags. Roaring with pain, pouring with rain. Chewing the doors, doing the chores. You are rooting more. See, interesting ones. That's all. I think I have taken just uh, 25 minutes. Now, as usual, let's end the day, end the lesson with a thought. What's that? If you can't be a good example to other people, if you can't be a good example to other people, then you will just have to be a horrible warning. It is an epigraph. Sleep on it and, and understand the depth of its meaning. Till we meet with another lesson or that is the first lesson on Ross Sunday. Take care. Be happy and